have this for the last few years. And uh, uh, yeah, I hope it goes well with a lot of musical students who uh, my PhD subject and everything else. But I'm very privileged to bring God's word this morning. Um, we have been looking at uh, the way of the world in contrast with the way of God. Uh, and uh, I like the way it is put here, uh, because when you say a way of the world versus way of uh, God, uh, we, we consider these two visions of what human life, life could be. Uh, because precisely there is a contrast in how both these two visions pursue the goal of what human life should be. What is the fullness of life? What is a good life in a sense? And these two visions provide different meanings of what good life could be. In today's sermon, I want to look with you to, uh, at uh, way of mercy as being way of Jesus in contrast to way of apathy being way of the world. But as I, as I do that, and before I do that, I want to continue this good tradition that we have started which is to read the word of God. Uh, and while we are doing that, we all stand up and we introduce new faces to read the word. So I want to introduce my better half and my soulmate, my wife, Jacqueline, <laughs> to do this, uh, uh, to read the scripture before us today. And she'll be reading from John chapter 5, verses 1 to 18. It's a long passage, but I hope uh, you find enough strength to keep standing. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to read uh, from the book of John, ver uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, the one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying here, there, and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and, walk, and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, uh, it is the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your, own, uh, your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are, uh, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at, uh, at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he uh, was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Is word of God. Thank you. Please be seated. So it's a long passage, and we, he, uh, we read a story of this uh, man, uh, and we, in some versions, it says he was invalid. In some versions, he says it he was paralyzed. Uh, in some versions, it just says it he was sick, but he was sick for a very long time. Now, I want to highlight here three characters in this story, and and point out how the world, uh, the systems of the world maybe, how they generate apathy versus how Christ shows us the way of mercy in our world today. 
Uh, but before that, even it is much more important to define what is mercy and what is apathy. Because mercy and apathy are not words that are very clearly dis uh, defined in our, in our world today. Um, let's take an example of showing mercy to someone. You show, a mer uh, you show mercy to a beggar. Uh, you may consider it mercy, but the beggar con may consider it pity. Uh, you may consider uh, something to be mercy which is com perceived completely different be, uh, differently by the one who receives your mercy. So how do we define these words? What is mercy and what is apathy? So I have some examples here, if it is working. Um, what is mercy? And I bring the first definition from Schindler's List, if you have seen the movie. Uh, Schindler's List is uh, among the best ranked movies ever. In this movie, there's a brief conversation between a concentration uh, camp leader named Amon and a businessman named Os Oskar Schindler, who saves 1,100 Jews from this con concentration camp. And in a very intense scene, both of them are drinking uh, alcohol together, and they sit against each other. And Amon says, uh, mercy is to, uh, power is to have control over people. And the fact that the Jews are afraid of us is because we, can, we, can, uh, we have power over them. And Oskar Schindler responds this. Power is when we have every justification to kill and we don't. That's what the emperors had. A man stole something. He, has brought in, he was brought in before the emperor. He throws himself down on the floor. He begs for mercy. He knows he's going to die. And the emperor pardons him. This worthless man, he lets him go. That's power. I believe in the Bible, this power of God to, to let people go, to pardon them, is we are told that's the mercy of God. In, in a dictionary it says, in a Cambridge dictionary it says, kindness that makes you forgive someone, usually someone that you have authority over. So now you have at least some of the things in mind. One of the things is you cannot show mercy to someone over whom you do not have power. You have to have power in order to show mercy. So you can show mercy to a beggar because you have the power in your wallet. The word apathy, likewise, has also different meanings. It can, uh, uh, it can lead to different interpretations. And I will show you at least two interpretations that are very prevalent in our culture today. But what generally is apathy? The word apathy comes from a pathos. Pathos means feelings, and apathy means the one who doesn't have feelings. One who has no feelings, no space for feelings. Um, so in sense, having no interest or energy to take action, to lack enthusiasm or concern. As I began to explore this definition more, I realized that apathy is understood generally in two ways in our culture. And this is what uh, I'm going to uh, talk about today. Generally, we can define apathy as an attitude like, who cares? That's one word that defines, uh, uh, that defines apathy. Let me put it this way. In my sermon today, I want to look at apathy of two people or two groups. One person, the paralyzed man, how he is going through a kind of apathy, and how the Jewish leaders or a community that is exercising, or, um, exercising apathy and in contrast to both, both these visions, both these voices of apathy, there is a voice of Jesus Christ, a very merciful voice. Let's look at, first of all, two kinds of apathy. Number one, individual apathy. When I tried to look for it, uh, uh, the definition of apathy on internet, I realized that we have come to think of apathy in mostly individualistic terms. What do I mean? If you look at the literature on, on, online uh, that addresses apathy, you realize that a lot of literature talks about how, uh, how you deal with apathy as a personal phenomenon. How do you, what do you do when you lack enthusiasm to live life? What do you do when something has happened to you and you have lost interest in life? And then there are a lot of self-help tips out there. It is because you have been through certain circumstances that now you feel that as an individual, you have become completely uninterested in life. You have lost the desire to live life. 
And you can express that desire in different ways. Maybe uh, you wake up late, you become a social, you don't attend events, you want to keep yours to yourself, you don't want to express your feelings maybe sometimes. Uh, it could be in different, it could be expressed in different ways. This paralyzed man probably is going through a phase of apathy in his own life, and you may wonder how. He sits in Jerusalem, Jerusalem which is known as the city of God. He sits near the pool named Bethesda. Now Bethesda in Hebrew, ironically, means house of mercy. He sits there for 38 years waiting for mercy. There is no mercy. There is no healing. We don't know how, how often did he come to the pool of Bethesda. Did he, sit there, did he sit there from morning to evening? Did he sit there only on Thursdays? Did he sit there only 9 to 12? We don't know. The Bible doesn't give us any detail. But we do know that 38 years is a very long time. And he has been coming there with hope of mercy, hope of healing. It is but natural for him and for us to lose hope if we have been stuck in a situation like him for a period that long. And yet, he comes to Bethesda. He wants healing. Like many of us today, he's a mixed bag of hope and hopelessness. This is why when Jesus meets him, he confronts him by a question. And the question is, do you want to get well? What sort of question is this? I mean, of course I do want to get well. That's why I come here. But Jesus asks this question. And in asking this question, he pushes him to realize whether he really needed a healing. Or coming to Bethesda had become a routine for him. Was he coming to Bethesda actually for healing? Or was he coming because... That's all he could do in life. There was nothing else that he could think of. He is stuck in a rut, probably that he was happy with. Maybe it is the first time someone is even asking him the question, do you want to get well? Because if you read his story, he, is, he, tells, he tells Jesus that every time I try to, try to get into the water, somebody else gets in before me. Maybe this is the first time somebody's even asking him, do you want to get well? But his response is even stranger. Instead of simply saying yes or no, he says, I try to get in and somebody else goes before me. I've been here in Kroningen for three years and I have been told that the Dutch are famous for many things. <laughs> but one of the things that they're most famous for is their directness. <laughs> I may be wrong and you know the answer. <laughs> And I've been told this often that they are very direct. And somehow I am also getting uh, this directness. So when I went to India last year, somebody asked me for a walk. Uh, somebody said, can we go for a walk because I want to share something with you. And I didn't have time and I said, no. <laughs> and I went home and I realized that this is not how you communicate in, in your country. <laughs> So this man, like me, probably did not, uh, did not have any Dutch influence in his life. And he did not know to say yes or no to Jesus. <laughs> Instead, he says, uh, I try to get into the water, but every time I try, somebody else goes there before me. He blames his circumstances. And there's nothing wrong in doing that, right? After all, we are all victims of our own circumstances. Is there anyone here who could say that he has come to Jesus or come this far as a blank slate. We all have our own circumstances that we have been victims of. And a lot of times we feel that we have been victims of our circumstances that we want to express to someone. We want to tell someone how our journey has been, how difficult it has been. But that's not all. If that is what you are, then Jesus definitely is open to listen to your story. Listen to your journey. But this man is, is does something which is even more difficult to understand. There are more things that are strange with this man. 
at the end of a miracle, there is not a single word of gratitude that you see here in this passage. Maybe he has uttered and John has not mentioned it for us. It's possible. The man doesn't even know who is his healer. When the Jewish authorities ask, who healed you? And he says, I don't know. And not just that, but when he comes to know that it was Jesus, because Jesus confronts him second time, the first thing he does is to leak this information to the Jewish leaders. <laughs> he goes and tells them that this was Jesus who healed me. Uh, this clearly appears to us, at least, uh, an act of betrayal. And perhaps this is why Jesus meets him a second time and tells him to stop sinning. Now, if you read some commentaries, they say that uh, this is why the, sick, uh, the man who was healed got angry with Jesus because Jesus talked to him about sinning. And probably Jesus pointed out that you need to stop this particular sin in your life. And maybe this, that's something that angered this man. Now, this is not something that's in the Bible, but these are... Uh, uh, this is what people have commented on, commented, and he gets upset and he betrays Jesus probably. Jesus helps him realize that his physical, physical healing could be a chance to renounce his apathy towards life, to straighten up, to be a man, to take charge of his life, but it does not seem to end well with the man. We we meet many today, and perhaps we ourselves experience this reality, apathy, a loss of interest and enthusiasm in our life, probably because we have not experienced anything new for a long time. We are stuck in this rut like this man, probably because we have been victims of our circumstances for far too long, or perhaps, like him, if one were to ask you today, do you want to get healing? You may need time to actually answer that question because nobody has asked that question to you for a very long time. The fact that if you are going through these issues and if you look at uh, resources online, uh, you will find hundreds of motivational and self-help talks available to you to get you, get you through this phase of apathy in your life. And indeed, there is a value in, this, uh, in these resources that are available. But some of you may even feel that there, th that, uh, that there is no help in self-help. Like this man who is sitting at the pool. And no amount of self-help can actually help him get to the water. He can be motivated, but he cannot actually reach the pool. He's waiting there. And probably some of you are going through that phase right now. Uh, and I want to pray and assure you that God will show you his mercy. In Jesus, he has shown his mercy to bring you out of your apathy and give you a new purpose in life. But there is also a second kind of apathy that we find in this passage. And that's, let's call it social apathy. Uh, strange enough, uh, according to some historians, uh, we just looked in the first point that uh, uh, Bethesda means house of mercy. And this is very strange, but some historians also say that Bethesda had a different, a second meaning. And the second meaning was completely uh, uh, very opposite to what you heard in the first, uh, uh, opposite to the fir first meaning, which is Bethesda meant disgrace, shame. Now you wonder why it would also mean shame and disgrace. Uh, people say that because Bethesda had so many sick people around it lying all the time, that for the city, for the healthy of the city, that had become a place of disgrace and shame. You know, the, sum, the, the number of these people uh, seemed so large that people began to call it a place of disgrace. Apathy in our community can be generated by pictures of the world we have in our mind, or the lenses through which we view our reality, which with which we view our world around us. Let me explain. In many places, a sight of the sick, an unfortunate person, a poor person, brings resentment rather than mercy. It brings contempt rather than mercy. This could be the case despite the fact that the people of that country, region, or culture may be very generous. And yet, 
they may be full of resentment for the poor that are around them. Take the example of our own times. We are constantly told today that the real image of man or human beings in general is that of a fit, healthy, and free from all deformities. And if you have deformities, if you are not fit, you are pushed to the margins immediately. Leslie Newbegin, who was a missionary to a British missionary to India, once said that these images are pagan, pagan images of man, pagan images. They are not Christian images. Uh, those who do not fit this pagan image are often pushed outside and are forced to live in the margins. Or let us say you come from a culture uh, where showing mercy is considered a feminine virtue. <laughs> So men, women can show mercy, but men should not, because that violates their uh, masculinity. <laughs> men are supposed to be strong-willed and therefore apathetic or, or show apathy. Or let us say you come from a context when you believe that mercy is, is, is regulated by the belief in cycle of karma. So you don't show mercy, because the moment you show mercy, you break the cycle of karma. For the cycle of karma to exist constantly, it is the cycle of karma that, uh, that gives justice. You, you, you reap what you sow. And so if, you sh if someone shows mercy, you're disturbing that cycle of karma. <laughs> and that belief can also generate apathy. Or think of Romans, the context in which Jesus lived. In ancient times, forget about Romans, uh, let's say all ancient rulers, they looked at mercy as a personal prerogative of power. It was never, never a moral responsibility. And if you don't believe me, you can read a, a, a book called uh, 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 Decline of Mercy in Public Space, uh, which talks about how Christianity has transformed our whole understanding of mercy. Mercy has become a public policy, as if. The governments have to be merciful. It is expected of them. In ancient time, it was not the case. The king could be merciful if he wants to, but showing mercy was his absolutely his prerogative, no, not a moral responsibility. These images that we see all around us in our culture can also influence uh, our understanding of mercy within the church. For instance, if your church or if your community is very strongly influenced by prosperity theology, what do we do? We consider the sick, the poor, as people uh, who, are, who are suffering the wrath of God, maybe. <laughs> or those who, are, uh, who, who do not have favor of God. Or those uh, who, have been, who are spiritually inferior to us. Or maybe under, uh, those who are under some kind of divine curse. Maybe it is sometimes if your church follows very strict ritualism, and uh, if, if that is the case, you do not expect people to turn uh, left or right from it. The Pharisees were like that. They knew the law. How else they could say that do not, to that sick man, do not pick up your mat, because it is sin on Sabbath. But the theology had become so rigid, they were so stuck with ritualism that there was not space for even God to come down, to break through and tell them that showing mercy is the way of the Father. These theological attitudes, these cultural attitudes can put so much of pressure on us and generate apathy in us. But when this happens, we focus on Jesus as someone who comes into a world and transforms our definition of mercy, our definitions of apathy, our understanding of relating with the other and relating to ourselves. And that's where we see the way of Jesus as the way of mercy. In this passage, Jesus confronts both individual apathy and social apathy at different levels. To the blind man, he reveals his mercy by healing him, by asking him a very difficult question that perhaps he needs to think about, and offering him a chance to turn away from his ways, to straighten up, to change his life. To the Pharisees, Jesus revealed his, reveals his mercy by showing them his authority, not only over physical sickness, but even over law itself. 
I believe that in calling us to be merciful, to, to be disciples of Jesus Christ, Jesus is in fact calling us to confront this apathy in our world today. Apathy at both individual level and apathy in our society. I believe that Jesus has given us mandate to, conf to confront this, to bring message of mercy to those who find life to be purposeless, aimless, those who have lost interest in life, those who find life to be a burden. We challenge those as disciples of Christ. I believe that we are called to challenge those who are looking at mercy in wrong sources, at wrong places, like this man who was just hoping that water of uh, the pool will heal him. But we are also called to confront this social apathy in our world today. And how do we do that? How do we do that? I believe that when we embrace people who are sick, I believe that when we show mercy to those who are marginalized, those who are oppressed, we challenge this pagan image of human being. This pagan image that tells that the only fit people, uh, only people in the world who deserve our attention are the ones that are fit, free from all deformities. We challenge the ideas and ideologies that try to convince us that the weak are to be the sacrifice if the world needs to become a better place. If the world needs to progress, this weak and this sick have to be pushed aside because that's the way to progress. There are thousands of stories where disciples of Christ have gone out of the way to show this model of mercy. Let me give you just one as I wrap it up. Pastor Lee Yong Rak and his wife, Chun Ja, I hope I'm pronouncing this properly because these are South Korean names. <laughs> so they found that in South Korea there was a problem. The problem was that of abandoned babies. Every year so many children were abandoned on the streets of South Korea, maybe due to family pressure, maybe due to poverty, or social stigma. Social stigma in the sense that uh, uh, in, in some cultures uh, the young mothers uh, or uh, uh, yeah, young and single mothers are really looked down upon. Uh, and, and, and also because of the social prejudice against the, against the, uh, the children who are not, uh, who are disabled, children who are uh, handicapped. And so this is why there's a lot of children were abandoned every year. This led Pastor Lee to place a box outside of his house. In this box, uh, there was a heater uh, and a sensor so, uh, and on the box it was mentioned, uh, this is a place for uh, uh, leaving your baby. Uh, and he left this box for a long time, but any time a mother comes and puts the baby, the sensor will inform the pastor and he will come out. Uh, and he will try to persuade the mothers uh, or, the, or the guardians to not leave the baby there. But considering that the situation was so dire, there were mothers who would still prefer to leave their babies uh, in, this, uh, in this box. Pastor Lee began to take care of these babies. From 2009 to 2019, in 10 years, he raised more than 1,500 babies. <laughs> and he ra raised these children, sent them back to society, made them very responsible citizens. They pro he provided them uh, foster care. He also connected them. He, he provided option for adoption. And th that's how he saved these babies. There was a movie made on this. It's a documentary. You can watch it. It's called The Dropbox. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we challenge the social apathy. An example of how you challenge the very view that those who are weak, those who are sick, are not to be crushed upon, are not to be left behind, but to be embraced. And this is how Jesus challenges uh, the, the, the culture of his own time. And see here, Jesus does this very intentionally. Jesus tells them, uh, he, he does this very intentionally on Sabbath, so that he can confront this culture of apathy. And when the Pharisees ask him, why did you do, why did you do it on Sabbath? And he, say, he gives a very, very, a very important answer, at least to me, it seems, which is that, he is doing this on Sabbath because he is doing work of God. Because it is God who is showing mercy even on Sabbath. 
maybe, and yes, in the Old Testament, the idea of Sabbath is very clear. God created the world and rested on the sixth, uh, on the seventh, on the sixth, seventh day. <laughs> sorry, on the seventh day. But that doesn't mean that God had stopped working. The fact that the the world is in its place itself is an evidence that God is at work, because it is in His grace that the world is sustained. But not just that. But God is continuing to show mercy even on Sabbath. And you, as his disciples, should not take Sabbath to mean that Sabbath is a day of rest, taking rest from showing mercy. <laughs> That's the first thing you should do. You should so, show mercy even on Sabbath. God's power is not limited to certain time, day, or occasion. It is something that the Father always does, 24-7, 365 days a year. And in that sense, God is calling us not to just show mercy, but become merciful. Because when you keep doing something 24-7, 365 days a year, you don't just show mercy, you become merciful. That is what God is calling us to do. But how do we start? How do we cultivate this mercy? That, uh, uh, how do we begin even to be merciful? Because that's not in our nature, right? The world around us is screaming at us and telling us to crush the weak and go ahead in life. How do we fight these pagan images of human being? What is the first step? Mother Teresa once said, if you can't feed a hundred people, and I know you can't, <laughs> then feed just one. Then feed just one. You know? um, uh, sometime back, a phrase became very famous. It was called ARK, A-R-K. Act of random kindness. <laughs> That's the full form. So how do you start? Maybe by act of random kindness. And then you cultivate mercy as disciple of Jesus. It, it becomes your habit. And then you don't show mercy on occasions, not only on five days, six days of week, but even on Sabbath, because it has become your habit. It has become our habit as disciples of Jesus. And my prayer this morning is that God will help us to do that. We'll become merciful people, not just show mercy, but become merciful and challenge the culture of ap apathy that is all around us. Shall we pray? Yeah? Lord, we are grateful as we come before your throne. We are indeed privileged people, Lord. We know you. We know you, the source of mercy, who did not sit there in heaven looking at our condition, but he became human being. And you embraced us, Lord. Despite our rebellion against you, you embraced us and you showed mercy to us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as your disciples, we'll continue that. It will become our habit to show mercy to people, Lord. We'll learn to cultivate mercy. We'll become merciful. We'll challenge the culture that produces apathy all around us, Lord. And we'll be vehicles. We'll be vessels of your mercy and grace, Lord. And we pray that you will help us to that extent. May your Holy Spirit strengthen us to do that, Lord. Because do we do know that it's a difficult task. It's an immense challenge, but we pray, O oh Lord, that you will strengthen us. Thank you for listening to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.